Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Genovese. I'm a professor of medicine in the Division of Immunology and Rheumatology at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Today, I will be presenting the highlights from a poster presentation at the 2003 ULAR Congress entitled Baricitinib, an oral Janus kinase inhibitor in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, 52-week safety and efficacy in an open-label long-term extension study. Baricitinib was previously known as LY3009104, or NCB28050, initially an insight molecule. It was designed to inhibit the Janus-associated kinases. Janus-1, Janus-associated kinase-2, and TYK-2 are all ubiquitously expressed members of the Janus kinase family. And they mediate signal transduction for a variety of cytokines involved in inflammatory conditions. Baricitinib, however, is a specific oral reversible inhibitor that has specificity for Janus-associated kinase 1 and Janus-associated kinase 2, known as JAK1 and JAK2. The data that we're presenting today is from the original JADA, or JADA, Phase 2b study. It was a randomized placebo-controlled trial in patients who had previously had an inadequate response to methotrexate. We initially presented the 12-week and 24-week data at previous Congresses. Now, baricitinib as a treatment has been given as 4 milligrams and 8 milligrams per day, and as that those doses, it resulted in significant improvement versus placebo over the initial 12 weeks and then in subsequently over a 24-week blinded treatment phase. The data we're focusing on in this presentation, however, is the 52-week data. The original entry criteria from the JADA study included at least eight swollen and eight tender joints out of a 66-68 joint count. Patients had to have been previously on a stable dose of methotrexate between 10 and 25 milligrams per week and at that stable dose for at least 12 weeks prior to enrollment. If they had been on corticosteroids, the dose had to have been stable for at least six weeks and the dose had to have been less than or equal to 10 milligrams a day or 10 milligrams of a prednisone equivalent. As well, they had to have elevation in their acute phase proteins. The C-reactive protein had to be greater than 1.2 times the upper limit of normal, or the ESR had to be greater than 28 millimeters per hour. The major exclusion criteria included recent use of traditional synthetic DMARDs, other than the methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, or sulfasalazine. If patients had previously been exposed to a biologic DMARD therapy, they were excluded from the study. They had to have an ALT that was less than three times the upper limit of normal and a bilirubin less than or equal to 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. As well, they had to have sufficient renal function um, to allow them to enroll, meaning that their estimated granular filtration rate, or EGFR, had to be greater than 50 milliliters per minute. In the original trial design, there were five treatment arms. Placebo, baricitinib at one milligram per day, baricitinib at two milligrams per day, baricitinib 4 mg per day, or baricitinib at 8 mg per day. They were, patients remained on this placebo-controlled, double-blinded design for the initial 12 weeks. At the end of that 12 weeks, we had a primary endpoint assessing the patient's responses clinically, and then the patients who were originally randomized to placebo or to 1 mg of baricitinib per day were re-randomized in Part B of the trial. Those patients were randomized to either baricitinib at 2 milligrams twice a day, or baricitinib 4 milligrams once a day. The patients who had previously been randomized to 2, 4, or 8 milligrams per day stayed on their arms, but they remained blinded to the treatment assignment through week 24. What we did after week 24 was allow all patients to enter the extension study, where if you've been receiving 4 milligrams or less of baricitinib, you are now randomized to 4 milligrams of baricitinib per day. For those patients who had previously received 8 milligrams per day of baricitinib, they remained on that 8 milligrams of baricitinib for the remainder of the study. Now, when we look at the patient disposition, we can see that most patients were able to continue throughout the study. We see that through 52 weeks, there was relatively little in the way of discontinuation in all arms. We did see, in general, roughly 22 of the 22 patients who had continued on the 8-milligram arm 
we saw only three patients discontinued. When we look at the overall demographics, the patients who initially entered the study and then continued on the study for an additional 24 weeks, meaning from weeks 24 through weeks 52, we see the majority of the patients were women, roughly 83% of the patients. Their average age between the initial randomization and the 24-week extension was age 51 to 52. Their disease duration was six years. The majority of the patients were ACPA positive, as were the majority of patients were rheumatoid factor positive. Their weekly doses of methotrexate were just over 16.3 milligrams per week um, for those patients who had initially enrolled, and those patients who continued on through the remainder of the study, the mean, the mean average prednisone dose was, excuse me, the mean average met weekly methotrexate dose was just over 15.6 milligrams. Roughly 50% of the patients were on concomitant steroids, and we know that their joint counts, based on the 28 joint count, were roughly um, 14 at time of entry for tender joints, and just over 11 for swollen joints, they again based on the 28 joint count. Their CRPs were elevated at entry, as were their ESRs. Overall, for the safety summary, through weeks 0 to 50, 24, we know that there were relatively few in the way of serious adverse events, with zero adverse events being reported between weeks 0 and 24 in the 4 milligram dose, and four serious adverse events reported in the 8 milligram dose. Between weeks 24 and 52, we did see an increase in the number of serious adverse events reported, so that the total of the number of events increased. We saw a total of 11 serious adverse events in the 4 milligram arm and a total of 8 serious adverse events in the 8 milligram arm. The overall number of non-serious treatment adverse events averaged between 62 and 72 percent between the treatment arms in the first 0 to 24 weeks. And in weeks 24 through 52, they averaged roughly between 53 in the 4 milligram arm to 63 in the 8 milligram arm, suggesting that adverse events were seen but we didn't overall see an increase in percentage or frequency of these events um, with continued exposure. We saw no opportunistic infections during the course of the study or cases of tuberculosis or malignancy such as lymphoma. There was one death that was believed to be associated with a myocardial infarction that occurred in the 8 milligram treatment group. There were, however, some clinically significant laboratory abnormalities, although they were relatively infrequent and only one patient discontinued the study secondary to a laboratory abnormality, and that was a patient who had an increased ALT. Overall, the incidence of serious adverse events remained relatively constant um, during periods 24 through 52, but again higher than we had originally seen in the 0 to 24 weeks. There were scattered events um, that occurred in a variety of different organ systems, but relatively few that occurred in the same organ system. When we look at the serious infections that occurred in this part of the study, we see that there was um, one case of uh, a gastroenteritis on the 4 milligram group, one case of what was diagnosed as a viral gastroenteritis in the 8 milligram group, one case of herpes zoster uh, in the 4 milligram group, um, and then two um, events of herpes zoster that were specifically defined by the protocol as serious, leading to a total number of herpes zoster cases of three that occurred all in the 4 milligram treatment arm. There was also one case of a herpes simplex that occurred in the 8 milligram treatment arm. There were other selected adverse events that were reported during the study that may have been particular interest to patients on baricitinib. That included anemia. We saw between in the weeks 24 for 52, there was one patient who was described as having an adverse event of anemia on the 4 milligram dose, and four patients who were described as having anemia on the 8 milligram treatment arm. There were a handful of cases of either nausea um, or uh, GI events. As well, there were other infections that were reported, such as bronchitis occurring in nine cases of patients on the 4 milligram arm, and five cases in the patients treated with the 8 milligram dosing group. As well, importantly, there were selected um, laboratory evaluations that we presented on here. Those included a change in cholesterol. Specifically, three patients who remained on the 4 milligram treatment arm were described as having an increase in their cholesterol in weeks 24 through 52, while there were no specific cases noted of the 8 milligram treatment arm. 
There was also an increase in creatinine phosphokinase seen in two tr patients treated in the 4 milligram arm, two patients who were described as having an increase in their ALT in the 4 milligram treatment arm in weeks 24 through 52. In general, there were also a number of cases where dyslipidemia had been described, specifically three cases that were reported in the 8 milligram treatment arm. There were no cases of hypertension treat, uh, described during the course of uh, the weeks 50, 24 through 52. We specifically looked, however, to see whether or not there was a large shift or even smaller shifts occurring in hemoglobins between baseline and then ultimately at week 52. There were, in fact, um, two patients on the 4 milligram treatment arm who, in fact, had a small change in their hemoglobin described um, uh, as a grade 1, meaning that they were between the lower limit of normal and 10 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. There were um, no cases of anyone who had a grade 2, 3, or 4 change in their hemoglobin over the course of the 52 weeks on those that had been treated um, and remained on the 4 milligram treatment. Of those who received the 8 milligram dosing regimen, there were in fact um, a total number of cases uh, initially of six that were either grade one or grade two um, uh, that um, uh, had been described by week 52, um, suggesting that there were a handful of patients who had a decrease in their hemoglobin. Overall, we were able to assess the efficacy measures um, initially from baseline through weeks 24 and then through week 52. Based on the ACR 20 responder criteria, we saw roughly 71% of patients um, were able to, of the 196 um, were able to achieve an ACR 20 at week 52. 49% of patients uh, achieved an ACR 70, and 27% of patients achieved an ACR 70. Specifically looking at the DAS 28 CRP, we saw that 41% of patients were able to achieve a DAS 28 CRP of less than 2.6. When looking at a higher level of response, specifically the Boolean remission criteria, we saw that 16% of patients achieved the Boolean re um, remission criteria um, over uh, the period of 52 weeks. For 32 out of 194 patients, or 16%. As well, we looked at patients um, that had been on 4 milligrams stable over the entire 52 weeks and compared them to those patients who had been on 8 milligrams stable over the entire 52 weeks. And we saw roughly the same, if not better, responses overall in those who had received the 4 milligram dosing group, suggesting that certainly 4 appeared to have as good, if not better, numerical efficacy at most, if not all, time points than the 8 milligram dose and in general appeared to have a better tolerability and safety profile than the 8 milligram dose. We as well had an opportunity to assess those patients who had originally been randomized to placebo or 1 milligram or 2 milligrams per day in Part A and then ultimately went on to receive higher doses in the other phases of the study. Specifically, we're able to look at those patients who, was, who were randomized to initially to placebo or 1 milligram per day and then went on to receive 4 milligrams or more for the second half of the study. We saw good response rates in that group, 71% of patients achieving an ACR20. We also looked at those patients who had initially received 2 milligrams and then ultimately went on to receive 4 milligrams. We subsequently saw very good responses there with increased improvements at the ACR20, 50, and 70 levels. We looked at patients who may have um, uh, escalated on to 8 milligrams because investigators and patients um, were unaware of the original. Um, treatment assignments for all patients that were randomized to their treatment groups. And so there was, in fact, a dose escalation option afforded to both patients and investigators that allowed them um, to uh, potentially escalate. We saw no substantial improvements for those patients who um, escalated um, uh, um, from, uh, to those doses. Overall, we believe that the treatment-associated adverse events and the serious adverse event profiles were similar to all patients um, that had uh, received the 4 milligram dose, um, as well as those receiving the 8 milligram dose um, during the course of the open-label extension. Ultimately, there seemed to be fewer adverse events in the 4 milligram dose when you did it cumulatively over the entire 52 weeks.
as well, the proportion of patients achieving an ACR response um, in low activity or remission at 24 weeks were similar um, or increased through weeks 52. And the clinical response for patients initially randomized to placebo 1 or 2 milligrams per day showed improvement over 52 weeks when they continued their dosing at the 4 milligram treatment group or higher. As well, data overall supported continued development of baricitinib um, as an oral treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and specifically, it has moved forward into phase 3 studies uh, exploring both the 2 milligram daily dose as well as the 4 milligram daily dose. Keep in mind that this study was done um, specifically looking at patients that were biologic um, naive, that had not pre previously been exposed to a biologic EMARD. Um, thus, um, the data we're reporting here really is on the uh, methotrexate inadequate responder population. During the course of evaluating the data from this study, we've had a chance to look at a number of subgroups. To date, however, we have not found any specific characteristics or circumstances that may have distinguished those who responded from those who did not respond to baricitinib. We have done some innovative post hoc analysis that has enabled us to identify um, that an early response to this agent, however, is quite predictive of longer term response. In fact, we are able to demonstrate through a number of analyses looking at the DAS and the ACR, ICR scores that for patients who did not achieve um, reasonable responses within four weeks, specifically looking at a DAS-28 CRP change of at least 1.0, we were unlikely to see those patients achieving high, level, high levels of response at 12 or 24 weeks. Specifically, if they didn't achieve a reasonable DAS change of 1.0 by four weeks, we didn't see ACR 50s or 70s materializing in those patients at 12 or at 24 suggesting that there may in fact ultimately be cutoffs in week four that will help be predictive as to whether or not patients will achieve meaningful, um, lasting, and high levels of responses with longer term use. Subsequent studies, as I mentioned, will be pursued in phase three, but specifically looking at additional patient populations, such as tumor necrosis factor inhibitor failure patients for either inadequate response or for safety issues. As well, we may further see patients that have had tried and experienced other biologic agents being studied in phase three. A final issue that has been brought up is the question of the ability of baricitinib to impede or slow structural damage as evidenced by uh, x-rays or radiographic progression. No standard or plain x-rays have been performed as part of the phase one or phase two development program. However, they will be explored as part of the phase three program. But we do have MRI results based on the phase two, phase two B study presented here, JADA, that did suggest a strong ability to reduce synovitis, reduce osteitis, and even demonstrate changes in cartilage over the 24-week MRI component of the study, suggesting that, at least based on MRI as an outcome tool, we can believe that baricid may in fact have some potential benefits on structural damage for patients with active rheumatoid arthritis who take this agent.